this whole play really reminds me of NBC Thursday nights in the nineties. Like it is uh-huh. like <laughs> friends, friends and, and Seinfeld, Seinfeld. <laughs> you know, it is just like, it, isn't that the kind of thing that Ross would say to Chandler? Like, Oh, friends. That means you've already gone from acquaintances and, and lovers. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you know, and the audience would laugh knowingly. I, I wonder if it's actually mad about you. <laughs> I wonder if it's the show Which before 90s Friends. show is... I don't see Mad well, About like, You because that was a functional, happily married couple. And so I, I just, I left the boards in my car Yep. and I was like, I'll get to that later this week. And I came up and I prepped my game and the game was great. And, uh, you know, here's yep, to, one. yeah, yes. Yeah. Pick one, um, which is kind of, you know, like that could bring us right around to, <laughs> to our play today. Helena, pick something. Pick one. Vanya, pick oh, one. Oh God. Pick um, one. Yeah. yeah. Well, Helena did make her pick and she stuck to it. Um, she did. She did admirably. Yeah. I thought, even though, even though you get the sense that she is really torn. Yeah, you see, that's a little bit unclear to me. But uh, we're now talking. Mm-hmm. I would say about Uncle Vanya. Yes. But congratulations on picking one uh, in your thank you in your play. You too. And I do think I'm always happiest with project days when I just decide today is a project day. And that's all I can do. And maybe I'll get a 20 minute bike ride at the end of the day. Or Mm -hmm. maybe if it goes really well, I'll ride the beach, look at the ocean, say hi to it and ride back home, which is a, you know, that's about a 45 minute adventure, but a a really good one. But uh, this is Uncle Vanya. Uh, I don't think I ever found the right translation. um, So I have a translation. That's that's fine. I'm working from that might be the one that I'm I've got that one. And then um, Let's see. Uh, who is my translator here? Don't know if it says. Um, I'm using the uh, the Project Gutenberg um, oh, ebook yeah. um, because it is really easy to get to. And then um, perhaps this is this could be the reason that I'm I, I'm layering some stuff on because the Vanya the Mammoth translation is what Uncle Vanya is. I just rewatched that this afternoon. You mean Vanya on forty second? Um, Vanya on 42nd okay. Street, yeah. Okay, which I have not um, done yet. I have not done yet. Yeah, so, but um, I won't get into too much of that, but it was a good way to cross-reference the text with... Did you watch the National Theater production of Andrew Scott's one-man show of Uncle Vanya? No, but I will. I feel um, like... That's right, because you sent that to me, and... Uh, I almost made it my trivia, but then I was like, wait, I already told Chris about this. <laughs> um... Uh, That's right. You sent me the, uh, yeah, you sent me, you texted me a screenshot. Wait, wait, I didn't realize what that was. I was just like, oh, Andrew Scott's doing a thing. And it it is a one man production of Uncle Vanya. uh, I will definitely watch that. (laughs) On on London's East End. Yeah, it sounds pretty Uh great. Um, So yeah, Uncle Vanya, uh, earlier (coughs) than the Cherry Orchard by a few years. His second. Five years earlier. Second major play, right? After the Seagull. Um, I don't remember the year offhand. Um, uh, I think it's 1899. Should we do the characters first? and the uh, Yeah, and let's the... do the characters and then a plot summary. Okay. I think is probably pretty good. But um, yeah, characters. Uh, we have, uh, um, we have, I believe Marina, Marina. is uh, the nanny. Um, and uh, we have her. She's sort of a an aged nanny um, and hangs around this particular country estate. We're on another country estate, not unlike the cherry orchard. Um, And uh, Michael Astroff, uh, the doctor um, is who we kind of begin with. And um, yeah, uh, Astroff is, he doesn't live at the estate. Um, He is kind of an itinerant doctor or transient doctor. He kind of travels around where he is needed. He has a a home Um, in the nearby town, right? Um, Yeah. Like the the county seat or whatever the equivalent would be. Yeah. But a frequent visitor, semi-frequent visitor. Um, We have Ivan Wojcicki, who is known by his niece as Vanya. 
Uh, in my translation, it always refers to him as Voitsky, which is a little bit confusing mm-hmm. given that he is the titular character. Yeah. Uh, we have Sonia, uh, Vanya's uh, niece. Um, we, and we are also made to understand that Vanya's sister, who is Sonia's mother, has died. And she used to be married to the next character, Professor Alexander Sarabrekov. Uh, so Vanya's brother-in-law from her prior marriage and Sonia's actual father. Yeah. Um, but but now she has a stepmom. Yeah, who is uh, Helena or Yelena, depending on what translation you're in. Um, and this is Serebrakov's second wife. Um, and uh, a great beauty we hear pretty quickly. Yep. Um, a minor character, but uh, like all Chekhov minor characters, deeply important. Um, Telegen or Ilya Ilyich, or as he prefers to be called, Waffles on the account of his pockmarked face. Does he prefer that or does he acknowledge that he is sometimes referred to? That's interesting. I wonder. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if he prefers that. He really comes right out and says it that that's what he's called, but I don't know. If you, that's an interesting point. Yeah, he is sort of like a merger of Yepi Hodoff and the other impoverished neighbor from uh, the last mm-hmm. play, The Cherry Orchard. Uh, we have Vanya's yeah. mother, the um, whose name I'm always forgetting. Um, um, Mademoiselle, uh, Madame Voitskaya. Voitskaya, right, yeah, because, yeah. because Vanya is Voit. <laughs> Voitsky, um, which are the masculine and feminine. That, those are all of our characters. There is a yeah. workman who shows up at one point. I, will, I have to say that Marina uh, being named a nanny is a much better translation. My translation refers to her as an old nurse, which is confusing hmm. because she shows up with the doctor. And you're sort of like, <laughs> oh, they must be like itinerant doctor they and nurse. Work they together. must work together. Yeah, and, then you're but like, it's and you're like, what? Nurse in the sense of nursemaid, I think, is, is my translation, as opposed to, you know, hospital nursing staff. As opposed yeah, to Nanny RN. is much better. Yeah. And, and she, she, really, she really fits that role. She's kind of like, she does some of the animal husbandry. She does some light duty around the it's estate. Like low-key she maid, kind of, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, she sort of looks after Sonia, but like there's sort of an interesting relationship between her and Sonia. But yeah, it's a it's a much more modest cast than the Cherry Orchard. Yep. Um, you know, like the Cherry Orchard, I think is probably almost double this. Yeah. Um, or you know, or maybe like a solid like third. three major characters who you have to keep track yeah. of. Yeah. And a couple more minor characters too. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> this one's a little easy. This one's a little more manageable. The math of it is a little bit easier to follow. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we made jokes last time that uh, in every checkoff play, in Act 1, everybody arrives, in Act 2, nothing happens, in Act 3, everything happens, in Act 4, everyone leaves. This doesn't quite hew yeah, to that it, model. It, it only doesn't hew in the sense that they're all already there. Yeah, yeah, they've, they've sort of recently arrived. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the action of the play unfolds over maybe about six months probably from like late spring to I would say like late fall and um, we are in act one we kind of meet all the characters Uh, the professor and his young wife Yelena are recently arrived at the estate Um, and uh, they've, they've kind of turned life upside down but we're still getting a sense of what life has been like at the estate we're pretty much Vanya and Sonia kind of run the estate and send money off to the professor who until recently has been living in town. Um, The doctor is here because the professor has sent for him. Um, The doctor, uh, the doctor thinks that the professor has gout. Um, The professor thinks that he has rheumatism. um, And there's a fair amount of conflict on that case. Um, We learned that Yelena has Yelena has sort of cast a spell over the men of the estate um, and people are kind of sort of fawning and mooning over her a little bit, um, but nothing, nothing untoward has happened yet. Right. Right. Um, yeah, no, I think all the male characters at some point comment on her beauty, um, but mm-hmm. nobody has confessed a crush or love. So act two happens very late at night um, after midnight <laughs> starts with Sarah Breakoff waking up 
um, he has aches and pains and he can't sleep and therefore nobody else can sleep and everybody has to fuss over him and he has to complain a little bit and he complains too much and Helena is like stop complaining and then Vanya shows up and he starts complaining too and then Sarah Breakoff starts complaining about Vanya's complaining and it's just kind of a tussle and to do and then I think eventually the professor sort of settles down and the action shifts um, and I think this is where Vanya confesses his, quote, love, or crush might be more accurate, of Helena. Uh, she does not encourage him in this. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we also learn that Sonia also has a serious attraction to the doctor. Um, and we learn that Vanya, since Sarah Brakoff has come back, he used to kind of it's weird. We don't really figure this out. We figure this out in this scene, but we get the sense through a few clues that he used to be quite active in the management of the estate. But since uh, the professor, Sarah Breakoff, has come back, he's kind of stopped doing that. And poor Sonia is sort of picking up the slack. So she's also kind of miserable, annoyed, although she has a very deep affection for Vanya, too. And so she can mm-hmm. only get so angry at him. Yeah. Um. Act three is a few months later. We're into September. Uh, We learn that the professor has a big announcement uh, that he is going to tell to everybody. We also learn that the doctor is here every day now. Um, And like work has almost like ground to a halt. Uh, Everybody is kind of continuing to moon over Yelena. Um, Sonia approaches Yelena and she agrees to the talk to the doctor on Sonia's behalf. Yelena does that, and there is this like horrible misunderstanding (laughs) uh, where the doctor thinks it is a ploy to seduce him and makes a pass at Yelena, and she rebuffs him. Um, And uh, as the professor comes in, this is all sort of interrupted by first Vanya coming in and witnessing the doctor kind of pushing himself upon Yelena. Yep. Uh, the professor comes in and his big announcement is that very similar to the cherry orchard. (laughs) He is proposing selling the estate, uh, in order to like, you know, as sort of an investment. They're going to invest, they're going to cash it out and then invest Mm -hmm. the cash in bonds and then an interest bearing bonds and then earn, you know, a comfortable 4%, which will be enough for him and Helena to live comfortably in the city. Uh, and Vanya, of course, rightly points out, well, what about us, uh, me and Sonia? Yeah. And, and, and then we learn, first of all, we get a bigger picture that Vanya and Sonia have really been working on the professor's behalf all this time, managing the estate, sending him the money, not taking much of the money, taking a, a low stipend. And then um, it turns out that Sarah Breakoff doesn't even own the estate. Uh, Sonia owns it all of this time. And... Um, <laughs> So the doctor's sort of like, I mean, calm down. Or uh, the professor's sort of, you know, calm down. I, I, I wasn't trying to get you upset. We don't. But Vanya just is infuriated um, and grabs his pistol and tries to shoot uh, Sarah Breakoff. And fortunately, he misses. Yeah. Um, in the, like a sort of very quiet moment in this act. Sonia asks Yelena, and it, it, it's, it's, it's set up right at the moment as the professor is about to make his yeah. announcement. Yeah, did you ask him? But Sonia, yeah. yeah, yeah, did you ask him? Yelena says, not right, I'm not going to talk about it now. Sonia interprets, she's like, oh, didn't go well. okay. Yeah. It didn't go well, did it? Um, and so in this sort of like amazing stroke, and we'll get to this later, like Sonia's heart is like breaking as the professor is like unfolding this very ham-handed scheme. Um, <clears throat> and in act four, uh, everybody, uh, now not everybody leaves, but because of the murder attempt yeah. and everybody sort of like trying to seduce her, uh, Yelena is like, I really want to get out of here. This sucks. Yep. Um, and they decide they're going to go. Um, Sarah Brikoff and Vanya like kind of appear to have made up and that Vanya is just going to continue sending the money that he's always done. Um, Everything is back to the way it was. Yep. Helena says goodbye to everybody. She 
sort of kisses the doctor in my in my uh, translation it says uh she kisses him impetuously yeah mine too yeah and then yeah. and and then and then is like that's it yeah. um well it's like everybody they do a little remains. cheek kiss and then she's kind of like ah oh, what the hell and i i get i get the sense that it's sort of like the last kiss in mash uh where it it oh my God. It, it is like it is a real kiss even though yeah. it is not designed to go anywhere beyond being a kiss mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then, uh, the doctor departs. Um, he says he probably won't be back until summer. Yep. Another moment of like minor heartbreak for Sonia. Um, and, uh, Sonia and Vanya sit back down at the table and get back to work. Um, and Sonia finishes the play with this like impassioned monologue that when she and her uncle are dead, they will be able to rest. And in that time, they will be able to look back on this joyless life <laughs> with some sort of sense of perspective. And I imagine the entire audience goes home weeping <laughs> in the St. Petersburg night. And I'll just read the very last stage direction. She embraces him. We shall rest. The watchman's rattle is heard in the garden. Telegin plays softly the guitar. Mademoiselle Voitskaya writes something in the margins of her pamphlet. Marina knits her stocking. We shall rest. The curtain slowly falls. <laughs> yeah. you, you have a question about directing. Let's go with that. If you were going to direct this play and you had an all-Australian cast of excellent actors and you knew that if to, if you had everybody speak an Australian accent it would be ridiculous sounding just because Australian accents are let's just admit it hilarious no eh? I don't think so okay, Vanya no. put that gun away there um, so but like all Australian actors we'll rest uncle go rest we'll uncle finally rest yeah. yeah you have a good rest then um <laughs> Like all great Australian actors, they are, of course, per- p- capable of perfect American accents and perfect mm-hmm. English accents. Um, yep. How would you direct their accents? What accent would you like the Australian actors to perform this play with? Wow. Um, okay. It's, it's like such a good question about plays and translation because you're like, well, what do you do? Like... Um, you know, like there's, it's like the hunt for red October thing. <laughs> like, like until the Americans get on the sub, the, the actors who are playing all the Russians speak in their normal accents. So, you know, you have, you have, you know, Sean Connery just doing Sean Connery well, as, you it's know. It's interesting though, because like Sam Neill and Tim Curry and the others speak English with a Russian accent, and Sean yeah. Connery speaks English with a Scottish accent, which somehow works because he's supposed to be like, that's right. He's like he's like Estonian from a fishing village. or Latvian yeah, or something yeah, like exactly. that. So you're sort of like, yeah, he's from the north, the yeah. the northern parts. But I think something changes when the Americans get on board with the accent. The, when the Americans come on board, they start speaking Russian again. And at the right. beginning, yes. Yeah. Yes. they're speaking okay. Russian to one another. And at one point, Sam Neill gives Sean Connery a book to read, and he starts reading it in Russian and finishes reading it in English. And that is how... I think there's a cool yeah. camera pan where you pan in while he's in Russian and you pan out of the book and right. he's back into yeah. English. And, then, and it's, it's, a, like, it's a really good moment. It's great. Like, That's a, that is, it's a, I, I it's actually a really think, good movie. <laughs> I think this is one of the rare... I think it's a perfect film. I think it is an actual yeah. perfect film. Um, yeah, and actually, if you recalled... Uh, one of my original proposals was we read the novel at some point. Um, I have read the novel. Yep. I went through a Tom Clancy phase in my youth and read a lot of Tom Clancy. Um, I also played the video game on oh, a Macintosh yeah. 2, um, which, was, which is essentially you're given a large map of the North Atlantic and like, you're just sort of like plot an underwater course to Cuba. <laughs> 
And like every run of the game ends horribly. Wait, like a, de- you know, a death like, charge, like a, a yeah, yeah, yeah. You just like yeah, it's it's a, it's a really so it like was a really Oregon bad Trail game. meets Battleship. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. Well. Uh, oh my god! I tried to teach Battleship to a pair of young children recently, <laughs> and like. There was this wonderful moment where the six-year-old kind of looked at me and he was like, why are we doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and like, like poor kid. He's like, you know, like the, the battleship game, you're like, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. And then like, it slowly dawns on you that you're just making random guesses yeah. and it sucks. Yeah. Um, but okay. To get back to your question. Um, I would have the actors stick with their native accent. Australian. Yeah. Wow. Um, because I think this is, so the, the, um, the subtitle of the play is simply scenes from country life, mm. which apparently is like either an allusion to Turgenev, mm-hmm. um, a uh, sportsman you know, sketchbook. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and because of that, I think I would try to lean heavily into whatever, wherever we were putting the play on, like wherever we were putting it on, Mm. I would try to lean heavily into the particulars of that location, you know? So like, maybe this is like, I don't know, maybe the, maybe we're like well inland of the coast of Australia, Yeah, yeah, you know, sort of in like a provincial area that has been... Perhaps like indigenous people for a while and then is being encroached upon by like uh, more colonial Australians. I think that that's what I would do because there's a lot of talk about the way that the environment is kind of being eroded. Well, Um, I I think that would work, particularly if you gave Sarah Breakoff um, a more like a recent colonist who speaks like a posh English person's accent. Which, yeah, like a Ponzi which, kind of which, accent. Which, you know, actually, like having met some white South Africans and some white uh, Tanzanians, that, you know, essentially the upper class colonists still sound English. It's the workers who develop the real, like wherever, whatever British colony we're talking about, it's the workers who ac- whose accent strays as far, you know, from the mother mm-hmm. country. And so if Sarah Breakoff sounded English and posh and everybody else sounded Australian, I think that could work. But I think part of the reason I asked this is, man, Sarah Breakoff's dialogue, to me, it just works better with an English accent. And, mm-hmm. and I think it's because the English are more class conscious than Americans are. You know, we have class too, but you can't really pick people's class from their accent. And in, and in no. fact, you know, the cl- it's, it's common for Americans to indulge their even wealthy Americans to indulge their working class mannerisms. You know, uh, yeah. you just think about the Texas oil man. Right. You know, or uh, um, whereas. Yeah, we've kind of lost that like northeastern mid-atlantic like the kennedy accent yeah. it's gone yeah i mean you like, can probably find it but it's it's much less common our movie stars don't talk that way anymore nobody sounds like orson wells the closest thing is the sort of midwestern broadcaster announcement announce it like the tom brokaw the sort of nebraska you know flat midwestern accent you know we have started war again with iraq uh, is that you know I, I just don't, I, for some reason, I just feel like this play would sound weird with an American accent and that there's mm-hmm. something particular about Sarah Breakoff's kind of just honest, his, his completely, I don't know, kind of clueless assumption of his privilege at everybody's mm-hmm. expense uh, that feels very... I'm not saying that English people are necessarily like that, but an English accent seems to characterize that. Like, if you just imagine whatever he's saying coming out of his mouth with an English accent, it just seems to work better. I have spent my life working in the interests of learning, and I am used to my library and the lecture hall and to the esteem and admiration of my colleagues. Now I suddenly find myself plunged into the wilderness, condemned to see the same stupid people... 
from morning till night and listen to their futile co- it's funny I'm, I'm sort of sliding into american transatlantic too but it, it <laughs> it's he just sounds pompous uh yeah. at all times and i feel like if he had a kind of i mean maybe you could get away with a texas oil man's accent uh too with him too which would be kind of fun but yeah that would be kind of great actually if you if you sort of set this like i mean it's a very like i kind of feel like you would want to set it somewhere in the midwest yeah like if you were you know i, I think that that's um, but he spoke he should sound foppish i think and he should yeah. sa- if it's yeah. set in the midwest he should sound like uh you know perfect example he should sound like george plimpton you know boston mm-hmm. brahmin right you know like yeah. who who played a very similar role in goodwill hunting right like um mm-hmm. he should have that sort of transatlantic sound and um anyway that was my question but what a, what a, <laughs> that was not not what i was expecting about directing that yeah. we would start with a uh, australian accent my question for you is just about the the opening lines of the play and what was your experience of it yeah but primarily like do you think your experience of the opening lines is changed now that you have read the cherry orchard <clears throat> i was nodding because i thought you were saying now that you thought you read the whole thing um no i had a very similar experience to reading the cherry orchard where I found myself struggling to care for the first Mm -hmm. act. Um, I felt like I followed the action really well, but pretty in, in with, but, but also the first act in the first lines, there's a lot of telling, not showing. I thought, um, so Astroff starts out and he's, he's, he starts out by complaining Ah, you know, I've toiled without repose for days, freedom since I've known you. Could I help growing old? And then existence is tedious. Anyway, it's a senseless, dirty business, this life. And he goes on to explain that he feels this way because he's basically a kind-hearted doctor and he's his sense of guilt and his sense of responsibility has him overworked, which is a reasonable complaint. But he does Mm -hmm. just sound like he's whining about life. And then when Vanya comes in, Vanya is also just whining about life. And later, in really not, and in, in it's, I would actually say it's not into the middle of Act Two, you realize, okay, Vanya actually has some legitimate complaints, but mm-hmm. it took me, <laughs> I would say, in my translation, it sounds like it's the same one, 30 pages for me to come to the conclusion that Vanya actually isn't just a whiner. Um, yeah. And so I did, I did find it difficult because I'm like, who are these people who are just like hanging out and people are making tea for them and they're just whining about life? Like this is going to be kind of boring. Um, and then and, and it actually led me to this conclusion. I don't know if this is true for plays in general, but I think for Chekhov plays, it might actually be better to read a synopsis of the play before reading the play in the same way that or, if you or if, maybe like seeing it before you read or it, or seeing it before you read it. I think that would work yeah. too, but either way that it, 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 and, and actually I think one of the really, really important bits of information that you need for everybody's behavior to make sense in this play comes about halfway through. And that is that I don't think it's told that Vanya and Sonia have been taking care of the estate for Sarah Breakoff's benefit yeah. and sending him the money for his benefit until about halfway through. I, uh, for me, it's on page 32 where Vanya goes on this sort of mm-hmm. like, it's after he's already like made his pass at Helena and she rebuffs him and then he starts whining again. And then he mm-hmm. says... For years, I have worshipped that miserable, gout-ridden professor. Sonia and I have squeezed the estate dry for his sake. We have bartered our butter and curds and peas like misers and never kept a morsel for ourselves so that we could scrape enough pennies together to send him. I was proud of him and his learning. I received all his words and writings as inspired. And now, now he is retired. And what is the total of his life? A blank! He is absolutely unknown, and his fame has burst like a soap bubble. I have been deceived. I see that now, basically deceived. And I was like, this would have been really fucking good to get early on. 
because mm-hmm. it just it made me just feel like Vanya was a kind of you know Larry David George Costanza type character who just complains no matter what yeah. and that's charming and he is like like he is yeah. that kind of character I mean like this is the DNA of George Costanza you know like this is the DNA yeah. in some ways of Walter Solchek like this is the DNA of Larry David um, there's another. Oh, this is the DNA of Mark Maron's persona. Like they all go back to Vanya, but it 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 was difficult because it took me because I don't think the information was there that Vanya had a reason for his complaints and there was something too. So it, it did take me until about then to really get into it. And I think I mean like, you know, you pointed this out in the synopsis is like when you're that that like everything has been sort of things are kind of topsy turvy. Yeah after the the professor and Yelena have arrived. Yeah. And like, you know, I I agree with you and I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to you seeing Vanya on 42nd Street because I think that a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, and this, you know, it's gonna be similar to the Cherry Orchard yeah. where you're like, oh, like that suddenly comes to life. Um, how does Vanya not end up as those merely comic characters? I mean, I would say out of those, you know, like, you know, um, George Costanza and Walter Zolchak are sort of the two that like get the closest. Yeah. I mean, like, I think Larry David is kind of like, all right, this is what I do. And it grates on some people, but it never really rises to the level of true pathos. And I think Vanya does. And how, if you, if, even if you don't agree with me, <laughs> how do you think Vanya gets there? How do how does how do we achieve actual pathos? Because I think I think there is some some very Titanic feeling in this play. I will answer your question, but only after you answer mine. Um, Excellent, because I do have an answer for you. But I'm curious. Okay. I, I think it would spoil All right. what I think might be a potential answer to the question I'm about asked you. Your question is, how does Vanya transcend George Costanza to actual pathos? It's not just funny yeah. that is miserable. It's also sad, too, basically. Um, why is this play titled Uncle Vanya? Well, uh, because the play is about Sonia. <laughs> because, like... Yes! The, the, this, yeah. I agree. <laughs> like, yeah. This, this play is a terrible warning of the dangers of what happens when you are not true to yourself in youth and suddenly realize the the other like instead of a, like um you know scenes from country life mm-hmm. like the subtitle of this play could be like um the destruction of middle age yeah yeah, 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 <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. because because Vanya and the doctor are both um, really wrestling with the fact that they are passing into middle age. Yep. This play is all about age. Mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, the professor is old. Vanya's mother is old. The nanny is old. <laughs> Vanya and the doctor are middle aged and they are very conscious of the fact that soon they will be old. Yeah. Sonia and Yelena are young. Yelena is 27. I will say, I, but I was telling you that I was a little disoriented at the beginning. I did love the line where Marina says, Astroff says in the second page, have I changed much since then? And she immediately says, oh, yes, you were handsome and young then. And now you're an old man and not handsome anymore. You drink, too. And I was like, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like she she has the freedom of of vocalization that comes with age. Yep. Like and I, I think one of my favorite scenes of the play is Marina and Waffles at the beginning of Act Four. Hmm. And they're just kind of chatting. Yeah. And and Waffles has this like like Waffles lines are just astonishing. He has this monologue about how his wife left him the day after they were married and he continued to send her money even though she had a child with another man. Yeah. Uh, and and he's sort of like, he's such a do-gooder that you're just like, whoa, what is going on here? Well, and he's also but, a bit of a fool, right? Because this is his argument against um, unfaithfulness in a relationship too. And here he tells you the story of his being 
uh, ridiculously faithful. Way too faithful. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think that's just part of the, the kind of irony of his character is that he, mm -hmm. he is full of contradictions. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, I think I agree that I think you said two things I completely agree with. And I, I just as I thought that the cherry or orchard's beating heart is Lopakin and not Leobov, you know, um, uh, I or Renaskaya, as, they, as sometimes she's referred to, I actually think Sonia is the beating heart of this play. And I think yeah. that Sonia, and to your point, I hadn't really thought about this, but I think to your point, Sonia still has a chance to be happy. Vanya doesn't. I mean, Vanya does yeah. if he really, really changed his thinking. Um, it would take a lot. But he doesn't seem likely to do that. Whereas Sonia, yeah. there's this moment early in the play, and I also think there's this moment with the doctor and her crush where Sonia demonstrates that she has the capacity to appreciate what is good about life despite its bitterness. Uh, and there's a couple times where she demonstrates this, where something doesn't go her way. And I don't think, I don't know, it's hard to know. It's one of those choices the actors would make. But I see it, I see it as actually Chekhov noting something about Sonia's character, which is that she is genuinely buoyant. And that, yes, these people are disappointed, they're working hard, um... She's frustrated in love. Um, he's frustrated because his life hasn't amounted to anything. And he's been kind of sycophantically attached uh, to the professor. And he's realizing that, you know, the, the um, he's realizing that he, he shouldn't have been, you know, that the professor mm -hmm. doesn't deserve yep. his loyalty or his sycophancy. And um, but he doesn't really do anything about it. His solution is to drink and complain. Um and whereas Sonia, even at the end of the play, you have this sense that, you know, I don't know, it's very, very, very bleak. But Sonia throughout has shown this buoyancy. You know, she could bounce mm -hmm. back. She could find something in life worth living for, something enjoyable. Hell, she could stop remitting to Sarah Breakoff and Helena. They don't have to do that, as I understand it. They're just doing that out of kind of regard and politeness. Mm -hmm. um, and it even sounds like Sarah Breakoff wouldn't be impoverished because he has some other, you know, he has a pension or something. He could probably afford to live in a cottage somewhere. And he, he wouldn't necessarily be able to live the extravagant life of a, of a manor lord. Um, but he, he would be okay. Um, so, yeah, I agree with that. And I think to answer your question then, Vanya transcends George because he is genuinely tragic and I think you said it he represents a counter example he represents a path that the young and the people approaching even the doctor is 10 years younger um, so mm -hmm. even the doctor has a choice right he's becoming increasingly Vanya like in his late yeah. 30s he's drinking too much he's complaining about his work um, He's lecherous. He's lecherous. Um, well, and lecherous, or he just he makes that unfortunate overplay for Helena, right? Yeah. He, he, we don't see him being lecherous in other dimensions that I'm aware of. Um, but it, it is interesting because, like, all of Vanya's bad behavior, the doctor sort of does to a lesser degree. He lusts mm -hmm. after Helena. He drinks too much. He complains. And you see the doctor, you kind of get the sense that the doctor is more recently on the Vanya path and that Vanya mm -hmm. is kind of a path of a talented, perhaps deep down, good hearted person whose life hasn't amounted to anything and whose solution to that is to complain and to drink. Yeah. And it's tragic. Yeah. That, you know, that final passage of Sonia's could be, could be performed so many different ways yeah. and depending on your particular sort of point of view about religion and the afterlife and philosophy and spirituality could also be interpreted so many different ways like you could definitely take a run at that that she is sort of giving up on the material life you could also take a run at it that sonia is the only character with like an actual spiritual existence yeah. <laughs> and that that nobody else has and that Yelena might have had, but there is this other very crushing moment when Yelena confesses to Sonia that 
she did love the professor, but then realized that it wasn't true. Mm. And you're like, oh my God, she's just, she's just staying. Yeah. She's, she's just staying even though she probably doesn't have to. Yeah. And I mean, the architecture of this play is such that you begin, you wonder if somebody changed something like these sort of three to six months, you feel like all of the characters have the possibility of becoming different. Yeah. And then the play kind of closes back on itself and you're like, oh no, 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 <laughs> Like, really? You're just gonna go back and like Yelena and the professor are just gonna go back to town and the doctor is just gonna be away for a bit. Yeah. And, and whereas the end of the cherry orchard, you know, something really does happen. Yeah. No, something case, really yeah. doesn't happen. Right. No, it's almost, yeah. it's almost, yeah. And even Vanya's murder attempt, it's kind of played mm -hmm. for comedy a little bit. But it's also sad. And Sarah Breakoff just brushes it off, you know, just like, yeah, mm -hmm. what kind of man doesn't forgive a good friend and shakes his hand? And then even Vanya is a little bit nonplussed by that. He's like, uh, the only people you don't arrest for murder are crazy people. <laughs> you know? that, that section, that particular section of the text yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Because like the, the, there's this dialectical argument that happens between Vanya and the doctor where they kind of work their way through the different insanities of the world. Yeah. And Vanya, and like the point that Vanya gets to is that the world is mad because it keeps us on her breast. Yeah. Huh. Which is like this just f like flooring remark. <laughs> Vanya's great regret is to shoot twice and to have missed twice. <laughs> Which is like, again, it feels like George Costanza comic timing joke, right? Like, uh -huh. ah, I'm full of regret. I missed twice. I mean, it's, it's irony, right? I, I do yeah. think that Vanya, from what I, my reading of it, Vanya genuinely feels both guilty because he's not at heart a murder, murderer and also embarrassed at having lost control too and then he's dealing with those feelings and the to have shot twice and missed twice is a kind of gallows humor right like a kind of joke yeah. at his own expense that was my interpretation of it but it could be maybe he still wishes he had killed the man but nothing good would have come from killing sarah breakoff it wouldn't have i mean he would have had to go to jail right yeah. uh sonia would be heartbroken because her beloved uncle was in jail uh helena might and her father is dead and her like it's so yeah. easy to forget that the professor is Sonia's that, biological father. That is very easy to forget, too. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, and you forget that. And then, yeah, maybe Helena would be free to have an affair with somebody. But who? She seems <laughs> like she kind of has like a secret crush on the doctor. Mm -hmm. But or, or it's it's not it's it's not even a crush on the doctor. It's a crush on the possibility, the possibility of having like, a crush. Right. Yeah. yeah it's like the, it's the that, possibility it's, of freedom, yeah. you know? Yeah. Even right. when she kisses him, it's more like it's more about her proving to herself that she could do that. And she does mm -hmm. say like, oh, I could see why Sonia would like him. He is rather handsome. He has delicate hands or something like that. And uh, yeah, it, it's one of those complicated but I think this is, again, Chekhov's human insight, which is that he recognizes that sometimes people are motivated romantically, not by their feelings for the other person, but the need for romance. Yeah. The, the, the representation of what that other person means to them. Yeah. And, that's, and, and I think that's the thing that I find so heartbreaking about Chekhov is that like everybody is sort of clambering for to be saved, but very often the things that they think are going to save them are never actually going to be go going to save them. Yeah. I mean, like Yelena is just, is just this like vessel for everybody's desire, yeah. which must be intensely frustrating. No, it really for reminds that person reminds me of the similar character in a visit from the goon squad. You know, the one who gets assaulted in the park, you know, Mm -hmm. who, is, who is sort of the same way. Uh, Kitty Jackson. Right. Yeah. Right. And again, and this is a, the thing I'm seeing with Chekhov is that characters can be pompous. They, they are all flawed in mm -hmm. some way or another. Sonia's greatest flaw apparently is just that she's not particularly attractive. Uh, I can't really find another flaw with her. 
Um, I even, I, you know, it's even admirable when 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 Helena intervenes on her behalf and talks to the doctor. It does. Sonia's not. She just wants to know, you know. Mm-hmm. She just is like she she. Let's rip the bandaid off. I don't think he likes me. Let's find out. You know, which I think is very admirable in that situation. When you have a crush on somebody who's not into you, the sooner you make peace with that and move on, the happier you are. You know, whereas like the tendency for humans is to do what Vanya does. He, he even says it. Yeah. He's like, I don't I, I know I don't have a sh- shot in hell, but let me just like wallow in my love for you, Helena. And she's like, Ew, yeah. stop, <laughs> you know. There's this great line that I think Sonia has where she says that Vanya is following Yelena around like a balloon on a string. Uh, yeah. You're just like, God damn it. That's so good. Yeah. Um, you know, like there's that, there's one moment when Sonia hesitates when like she asks Yelena and then there's a brief moment where she's like, no, 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 it's better to have hope. And then I think mm. the scene moves on in such a way that like the die has been cast. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and it's not going to be able to be taken back. And that's so real. Yeah. Like those are the feelings you go through where you're like, yep, I just want to figure out. I just want to like rip the bandaid off and, and figure out if she likes me, but no, wait, no. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's um, <laughs> the other thing I thought was really good is I don't think men do this. Um, but the way mm. that Helena and Sonia sort of put aside what Jennifer Egan would call their structural structural enmity, and they just decide to do it. And yeah. I don't know that, I don't think men do, I think the way men would do that is like, let's go fishing together, and you realize you have a good time together, and then without saying it, suddenly you're buddies, you know, or mm-hmm. like, whereas like, and I, I think this is true for women, where they'll just be like, you know what, I'm tired of us fighting, why don't we be friends? You feel yeah. that way? I feel that way too. You feel that way too? I feel that way too. And then they embrace. And uh, I thought, I, right, like, yeah. I thought, I, I, like, oh my gosh, I thought you didn't like me. I thought you didn't like, you know, it's like, there's so much less ego right. involved. They, I think women can be very direct about friendship that yeah. way. And that makes me think of another moment in the play of when now it's two men who are talking mm. and Vanya says that he and Yelena are friends and the doctor says, ooh, friends. Already? <laughs> already and the and and you know and and vanya's like what do you mean and the doctor's opinion is that it goes acquaintances lovers friends right and i i just you know like set against the scene that you're talking about where sonia and yelena just decide to be friends yeah um and it's a much less loaded kind of thing um yeah, I wonder, one of my questions was like, what, what do you think about that that opinion, that point of view? Do you think it, I mean, it's not true, but is there something true in it? I, I, I think I think it's not true, but there's something true in it is, yeah. yeah. I think it is, particularly for these kind of sexually, romantically charged situations where if you, I've been in social worlds where there. I'm sure there there are opposite versions of this, but I've certainly been aware of being among a group of people in which there's one woman who all the men are interested in. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think that for a man in that situation, it can feel like, well, I have to make my try. Mm-hmm. And if I make my try and I'm rebuffed, then we can be friends. But until I make my attempt, we can't, we're just going to be, will they, won't they? We'll be... Right, we're flirty acquaintances. Flirty acquaintances. Um, And and I don't think that actually has to be true. And I think when Mm -hmm. we get older and or more wise or more experienced we can sort of make an assessment and think oh i don't actually think this person would be a good match for me or i don't think i'm a good match for this person or they're clearly happy with their boyfriend or husband and i don't any sort of attempt i would make would threaten that happiness and i'm not willing to do that and so i think a mature person is able to make friends with somebody who is attractive um, but Vanya is not particularly mature, uh, and neither is the doctor in this regard. And I think it's very common, you know, for at least among people I know, if you're in your 20s or early 30s, to not 
take that more wise view. Yeah. Um, so I do think there's some human insight into that in the same way. It doesn't have to be that way. But yeah. I mean, this all, though, like this whole play really reminds me of NBC Thursday nights in the 90s. Like it is uh-huh. like <laughs> friends, friends and, and Seinfeld. Seinfeld. <laughs> you know, it is just like, it, isn't that the kind of thing that Ross would say to Chandler? Like, oh, friends. That means you've already gone from acquaintances and and lovers, yeah. right? And, yeah. you know, and the audience would laugh knowingly or just like, you know, it could be season, you know, uh, Ross's ex-girlfriend makes friends with uh-huh. Rachel and they, you know, embrace and decide they're going to be friends or something like that. Or Ross's new girlfriend makes friends with Rachel, <laughs> you know. I, I wonder if it's actually mad about you. <laughs> I wonder if it's the show Which before 90s Friends. show is... I don't see Mad <laughs> well, About like, You because that was a functional, happily married couple. That's true. Um, You're right. Yeah, and that is... Yeah. Whereas, you know, I would say, like, the love triangle stuff really reminds me of mm-hmm. Friends because in Seinfeld, there wasn't a lot of will they, won't they. There wasn't a lot of love triangle. It was It was usually George or Jerry or Elaine is dating somebody and, there are, and foibles ensue. You know, right? Yeah, that, that's there's the, some that's problem the... in the relationship which they have to go <laughs> talk about at the diner. It, it's you know she doesn't know about shrinkage or like <laughs> he doesn't do everything or I was scratching. <laughs> you know, whatever it might be. Um, sometimes a man has an itch. You know, it, it it it's it's a foible. Whereas Friends is the one where you know somebody's attracted to this person, this person isn't attracted, but this person agrees to intervene on the back of this person, yeah. but then it turns out these people are actually... Like, the, the exact scenario between Sonia, and, and, Helena, and, total and the doctor. total disaster. And total di- yeah. disaster. And yet, they somehow hug it out in the end. Um, and, you know, yeah. they go back to their beautiful apartment and everything is okay. And then they go hang out in it's the funny, and like, dance to the Rembrandts. Like, Vanya could... Vanya does have the structure... Of like uh, like a sitcom yeah. because like at the end of a sitcom you you gotta you gotta re- you gotta reset like it has to be returned to start except for it's like start is not as miserable right it's it's yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. A, it's like a comfortable <laughs> you know ah we sure wish that Ross had a girlfriend or like yeah. we sure wish that Jerry could like finally like get some traction with his career or we. We hope that George like finally gets a job and doesn't have to take unemployment anymore. But it's still like I, I, a great example of this. I, I really like the show Cowboy Bebop, the anime, too. Oh, yeah. And yes. Yeah. You introduced me to it and I've watched it. I don't know, 10 times since you introduced it to me. Well, and how often does whatever gambit they're doing on that episode fail and they just go back to like Spike complaining about the food yeah. that Jet's cooking uh, and... Uh, oh, Jetto! Jetto! Oh. So, like, and and uh, oh. the woman, I forget her name, like making fun of both uh, of them. And then May. And then May, May making fun of both of them. And then like the kid like breaking something in the kitchen like while doing Kung Fu. Yeah. You know? and, 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 the, and the the brilliant and, and the, the corgi, like, like, computer-minded corgi, the corgi like, like floating through in zero G, like with the little legs. <laughs> yeah. like, like, but the smartest character on the show. Yeah, absolutely. And you occasionally yeah. see that, right? Like the Corgi occasionally yeah. uh, does something really smart. It's it's really clever, though, because the other characters have no idea how smart the Corgi is. But, um, but yeah. all of this to say is that, yes, it, the structure of the 90s sitcom is character tries to do something, fails hilariously, reverts to the resting state. And that's the, the yeah. structure of this play. It's just that the resting state, resting state, is extraordinarily miserable and depressing. Yeah, it's. Not, I mean, and and you sort of get the sense that it's even worse because I mean, Vanya and Sonia have been doing this for Sonia's whole life, yeah. And then uh, for you know twenty years of Vanya's life, and unfortunately, they've had this kind of rupture over this summer, and now you're like, wait, they're going to go back. Yeah. They're gonna they're gonna keep going with what they were doing before, despite this like huge like Yelena bomb that is kind of dropped in the estate. And you think and it makes it even it's sort of a lessening. Yeah. And like whereas a lot of the nineties sitcoms or Cowboy Bebop, there's this as the wheel turns, small things get better. Right. So like when Cowboy Bebop starts, it's just Spike and Jet. Yeah. And then we pick up May, yep. and then we pick up Edward. Um, and like 
you know, and the the story progresses towards some kind of grander place. Well, they become, and then same thing with Seinfeld. Like George gets a job with the Yankees, yeah. and things get better. And what worries me about Vanya is that I I suspect that things are getting worse. I think that's right. Yeah, and I think in both Friends, uh, Seinfeld, and Cowboy Bebop, there is always the comfort of found family. Um, yeah. And so Ooh. even, you know, you. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> I'm like, I see where you're going. <laughs> well, there is. I mean, you know, this isn't a found family. This is just the family. family. I mean, I guess the only comfort is that Sonia and Vanya seem to have genuine regard for one another. And it is, you know, if you sort of I don't know how hard they have to work to manage the estate, but it's like it seems like they have enough food. They're in this beautiful hinterland with forests and gardens and things like that if they could look at it another way maybe it would not be such a bad life certainly any peasant would probably rather have Mm -hmm. their life than um you know the the toiling in the fields all day they're not doing that they're managing the people who do that Mm -hmm. you know and they're scraping out a little bit of income here and there and i mean it is it's the misery of bourgeois existence and there is that that sort of sense of if you are raised with a little education and a little bit of comfort, not a lot, you're not wealthy, but a little bit, you scrape up against what you see as true greatness from time to time, mm-hmm. and and you aspire to it. And for many people, you don't get it. And then the question of life becomes, well, what do you do about that? And do you still find something worthwhile yeah. and enjoyable in life? And again, this is why I think Sonia is the beating heart is that she actually has she she strikes me as having the capacity to do that will she do it i'd like to think so i like her i'm awfully fond of her i have one last question for you but we're kind of dancing around it i I, there's a part of me that wonders if like stanislavski is gonna like pop out of the grave with a top off top hat and be like ha ha it was big joke Chekhov is only pretty good playwright. Great actors can make anything a good play. Because the, the, the action is so limited and ordinary. Yeah. And, and my sense is that, and, and I think that, you know, the more reading I do, people consider Chekhov to be like maybe the second greatest playwright ever. And yeah. part of it is that I don't read Russian, so I'm not able to appreciate the original language to the same degree. But it also, it, I wonder... Is this really, really great? Or would any gra- can any great group of actors with a great director take any okay play and make it great simply through great choices? Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. And I, but I think that these, I really do think these are some of the greatest plays ever written because like, I don't know if Coco Chanel read Chekhov but like he keeps taking things out mm. like like you could you're never going to describe a checkoff play as overwritten right yeah because like just like your experience you're like i can't figure out like where is the initial incident <laughs> like it's not it's not even revealed until halfway through act 2 but i think that he had enough faith that he was creating real people yeah and that if he could write down the way that real people moved through the world emotionally, that good actors could pick up on that and take these confusing, perplexing, weird, contradictory, at some points, like nonsensical texts. And like, and, and it's like, it's like the texts are two dimensional. Yeah. And like the actors literally like they raise the, the barn dimension. of the play. Yeah. Well, and what that makes me think, I think that's right. And it, what's it's clear also that he is a great gift for, um, yeah, he described emotional realism. And mm-hmm. these characters are very normal. There's not, the stakes are not that high in the sense of like life and death. Most that nobody actually really thinks it's not like, Sarah Breakoff is being hunted 
by uh, Vanya the entire time. It's not like the the most dangerous game, right? You know, or like um, <laughs> it's another part of the the Taken franchise, right? It does. Like it, Liam Neeson is going to get in there. Liam Neeson, <laughs> Chase or Ch- Brokaw, yeah, down exactly, and, and like fuck him up. Yeah, that it, the, that the violence is almost is incidental to the story. Yeah. Um, it is it, the violence is simply a manifestation of all the tragedy and anger in Vanya emerging i mean it would have been shocking if he had actually killed him and weird and it, and so that does ring true what you said and i also think that i don't know much about the history of 19th century theater but i suspect that both the drama and the comedy was much broader prior yeah. to this yeah. and that it's probably perfect for Chekhov that you have this naturalistic form of acting in Stanislavski and the method emerging at the same time uh, as his writing. Because I think if you had a- actors who acted the way they did in the 19th century, I don't think it would work. Everything would sound kind of ridiculous. And, yeah. and then I also think what is kind of amazing is that that generation of actors c- go- goes on to influence the the next generation of acting coaches who then influence the golden age of cinema or the silver age of cinema acting. You know, that these are, yeah. it's basically people who Stanislavski trains, Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler, Sandy Meisner, who go on to train that what many people consider to be the greatest generation of film actors, you know, Dustin yeah, Hoffman totally. and, and, um, Robert Brando, De Niro and Brando Pacino. and yeah. yeah and Brando I don't think took those classes but he and both Brando and Dean are of that style you know they they yeah. are you see them thinking you see the internality of their characters and I think these plays only work with that kind of I don't, imagine somebody doing a Shakespearean performance of this play it would be boring i think and silly there'd be some laughs right like there'd be some good yeah. there's some good clowning moments like waffles and the nurse would get all the laughs yeah because of that yeah i mean like speaking. the only character who has the bigness of like a 19th century shakespearean performance which were declamatory yeah like you know i mean like like shakespeare only becomes non-declamatory in like the 1960s, right. <laughs> you know, with like Laurence Olivier, another method actor, yeah. you know, kind of layering this stuff onto it. And yeah, only the professor would hold up to that kind of bombastic kind of performance. And you, you pointed out that that's the role he plays. Yeah. All right, let's go to trivia. Yep. You first. I think uh, it's, it's you first or me first. You first. Okay. So. Um, It doesn't happen in this translation, but in a lot of translations, um, when Sir Abercroft um, opens his talk, uh, he says, ladies and gentlemen, I regret to inform you we're being visited by the inspector general, Hmm. uh, which is a joke and a joke that would have gone off in Chekhov's time. And these days requires, you know, like, like you got to kind of know what the inspector general is and was. Um, so is that, a, is that joke referring to what other Russian author's novel? Mm. Was it A, Maxim Gorky, B, Ivan Turgenev, or C, Nikolai Gogol? When does this happen in the play? Uh, when Serebrikov, um, in act three, um, oh, when he's about to make his announcement, summons everybody to make his announcement. The first thing he says is, uh, is we're being, inv- we're being visited by the inspector general, which would not have been a good thing. Right. Like that would be that, that's sort of roughly if like the head of the FBI decided to like right. show up at your house. Right. And even if it was a friendly visit, you would be like, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm going to say Gogol because Gogol was the great uh, satirist of the bureaucracy and the inspector general feels like the sort of visit you would have in a Gogol story or, or novelette. You got it. And I don't know if you know that book or play, it's a book or novel itself, but I was sort of like, ah, I was like, this is going to be a damp squid squib if Jesse 
knows the author, but it, it doesn't sound like you. I don't think I know that one. I've read The Overcoat and I've read mm. uh, The Petersburg Tales. Um, yeah. And I, The Overcoat is great. Oh, The, the Nose. And The Nose. Yeah, I think The Nose the is nose. one of the Peter, Petersburg Tales. Yeah. The <laughs> Nose is weird. Uh, so weird. Yeah. So wonderful. Yeah, it is. Gagol must have been such a weird guy. Yeah. Ukrainian. Apparently, the play has a really weird production history mm. where it didn't get performed in Moscow um, until it had been like it had been published for like two or three years and had this real successful run of like, you know, basically like summer theater, you know, um, oh, interesting. like like summer all stock, around Russia. Popular favorite. Yeah, like summer stock. Yeah. And Chekhov had never seen it performed. Mm. But Maxime Gorky wrote him a letter saying like just how like emotionally like like torn apart he had been by the play. It's, this is like the equivalent of if Chekhov was Steely Dan, including the line, turn down the eagles, the neighbors are listening. <laughs> that's amazing. I did not know that that was a quote of Steely Dan's. That's, in, that's wonderful. Turn down the eagles, the neighbors are listening. <laughs> Something like that. Wow. I, you, you could look up what the name of the song. Sick burn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole Yacht Rock episode about about that. Uh, uh, God damn it. I, I mean, like, I remember Steely Dan showing up in Yacht Rock brilliantly. Oh, apparently. As, like, this, like, foursome that is, like, incomprehensible when they try to speak. Um, but I need to go back and watch that. Apparently it's turn up the Eagles. The neighbors are listening. Um, Interesting. that's okay. weird. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, apparently the, those guys got along fine, but in okay. the yacht rock episode, it is, uh, it is represented as a bitter rivalry between the nerds and the jocks. And of course yeah, the Eagles are the sure. jocks and Steely Dan are the nerds. Um, okay. Your trivia. Yes. So there's a part of Chekhov's life that appears to have directly inspired at least one element from Uncle Vanya. Was okay. that part of his life, A, that Chekhov worked as a medical doctor and often didn't bill poor patients for his services? B, Chekhov's brother-in-law once fired a pistol at Chekhov's grandfather and missed? Or C, Chekhov's grandfather did own an estate and embarked on a campaign of restoring the white birch that had been cut for firewood in the local forests by a local uh, bourgeoisie entrepreneur. God, is there an all of the above option? <laughs> D, all of the above. Oh, God. Because, I mean, like, he was a doctor, and he sometimes didn't charge for his services, but I could also really see C. Oh, these are, this is very well done. Um... You know, there's enough ties with the wood demon and the birch thing seems really detailed. I'm going to go with C. You had it the first time. It's A. God damn it. He was a doctor and didn't charge for his services. Like now, classic Chris. If you can find evidence that his grandfather did, it's entirely plausible that his grandfather planted birch uh -huh. trees uh, in the woods. This does seem to be something Chekhov was interested in. Then I will turn your buzz into a ding. Into a half ding? Full ding, if it turns out to be true. Full ding? Ah uh, yes, retro, okay, a retroactive, yeah, a, a retro ding, a, a retro ding, one of our one of our favorite things. Um, yeah, it's like uh, it's like subjective time here on Upper Middle. It's Brow. like it's like when uh, you buy something from Sears and then you find a coupon for the same item, you know, for twenty dollars less, and you cut that coupon out and take it to Sears, mm -hmm. and they give you your twenty dollars back. And they say, yeah, sure, okay, yeah, we can do that. Yep. And you're like, wow, this is great. You guys are going out of business. Too bad. Too bad. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, well, uh, next up, everybody, uh, we are going to be shifting to watching another production. Um, and that's Louis Malle's 1993 film, Vanya on 42nd Street, which you can now watch for free if you're an Amazon Prime uh, member. It's on Amazon Prime Video. Um, obviously, it's not free if you don't. So you probably pay you know, three. Not, I bet you could pay three ninety nine to watch three ninety nine for it. Yeah, I feel a little bad shilling for Amazon in this particular moment, but whatever. It's also on the Roku um, channel for free. Oh, interesting. And you can, if you don't want to give Amazon money, you can watch it on YouTube or Apple TV for three ninety nine. Lots of options. Very nice. You can, yeah, you can more options. You can pay than whichever corporate theaters. overlord you prefer. 
Yeah, no, it's sort of like I, I really would prefer to pay the National Theater more money, but you know, fourteen dollars a month is is a significant investment. Hey, check your local library. You never know; they might have the DVD. Yeah, that's true. That is up next. In the meantime, Upper Middle Brow remains a small point production. Chris Bag and Jesse Dukes are trying to restore the forests to their past glory. Music by Ben Pajak and Jesse Dukes. Design and website by Chris Bag. You can learn more about us and find our listener survey at uppermiddlebrow.com. And please review us in your podcast app so other people can find the show. And as a reminder, everybody, uh, Jesse and I are both writers and editors, and we can help you with any kind of creative project, writing, podcasting, editing. And you can see some of our portfolios and learn more about us at our respective websites, chrisbag.com and jessedukes.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. And see you at Vanya on 42nd Street. It's so good. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. (laughs) 